I think that that confidence, that perseverance, that ability to believe in myself all came through my training. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 254. And today we're joined by Sensei Buzz Durkin. If you're new to the show, why don't you go head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes for this episode 254 or one of the other episodes. Not only do we have the show notes, but you can listen from there. We have links to plenty of other stuff, our guests, our social media, and you can get to whistlekick.com from there. At whistlekick.com, that's where we sell our products, our sparring gear, our apparel, and the other things that we are slowly rolling out as we expand our product line. You can also find links to the other websites that we manage, like martialartscalendar.com, a free place to post or view martial arts events, not just competitions, but seminars, testings, charitable events, and we're trying to build that up. We've put a lot of resources into it. Hopefully, you will help us make that grow. If this is your first time tuning in, you may not know my voice. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on this show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel, and I am a passionate martial artist who says often... I have the best job in the world because I get to talk to other people about martial arts all the time and call it work. How fortunate am I? I feel very fortunate today because of our guest, Sensei Buzz Durkin. I've long looked up to this man. He is hes kind of a legend, at, at the very least in the New England area. Everybody knows who he is. And somehow our paths haven't crossed. Well, after this episode, we're going to change that. Sensei Durkin is not only a practitioner of martial arts, but he's also founded his own successful karate school, and later on he wrote a book about how he did that. Today, we hear stories from before, during, and after his time overseas, during the Vietnam War, and how those chapters of his life have connected to make him who he is today. He's got a lot of great stories, so without further ado, Sensei Durkin, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. It's my pleasure to be here. Well, the pleasure is mine. You know, the irony, of course, is that you're nearly in my backyard, or at least in the way we define a backyard in New England. You're pretty close, just a couple hours away, and yet we've never met. And at the same time, as I was telling you, listeners, I feel like I know Sensei Durkin because we have so many folks in common, so many people that have trained with him, trained under him, and they've had nothing but amazing things to say. So I'm just honored to have you on the show today. Well, I'm thrilled to be speaking with you, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Sure. People may know your name from some of the some of the books. They may know you as someone who is is known for a karate style that is not the first one that comes to mind when people think of karate. And I know we're going to get into all of those things and a whole bunch more. But I'd like to go back. I'd like to go back because I don't know the answer. How did you find martial arts? Well... I was a student at Boston College at the time, between my junior and senior year, actually. And uh, that was the time, 1966, 1967, the Vietnam War was very on the forefront of, of everything. And uh, I knew that I was had a couple of choices upon graduation from college, and that would be to claim a medical deferment, uh, go to Canada, or do my duty and serve a couple of years in the military. And I chose the, the latter. So... Uh, Knowing that, I, came, I grew up in a fairly well-to-do middle, upper middle class family, knew nothing about fighting, nothing about self-defense, nothing about physically taking care of myself. So uh, one day I thought that would, I joined the Army ROTC actually at Boston College. So when I graduated from BC, I, I became a second lieutenant in the Army. Uh, so I thought self-defense would be something cool to know. So one summer my college roommate and I went to Boston and just took the yellow pages out and started looking for martial arts schools. And that in and of itself was quite a quite a journey. Things were quite different the way the martial arts were taught and the way they were approached in those days. Uh, for instance, most martial arts schools were on the fourth floor where the rent was cheapest. With, uh, it was either a hot oven or freezing cold, uh, s summer or, or, or winter. And so we went to a number of different schools uh, and we didn't have much luck. Uh, the, the, sometimes the, the places were very dirty. Sometimes the teachers were very brutal. Sometimes uh, it just wasn't a good, sometimes the teachers would never show up. But we, so we went to several martial arts schools and uh, as a last resort, we found this uh, Matson Academy of Karate, which we uh, went to visit. 
and the people were very nice, welcoming. The place was very clean. It had a good atmosphere. And uh, so I said, Let, this looks like the best place to start. So not knowing anything about what type of karate was taught or, or anything like that, we just took lessons. And for me, the first class, I fell in love with it, really. I just I couldn't get enough of it. And my, interestingly enough, my college roommate lasted about one week, 10 days, and he hated it. He couldn't stand martial arts training. But for me, I just loved it. So I started training at the Matson Academy of Karate in Boston, 1966, and uh, it's been a pleasurable ride ever since then. Uh, I, I still have the same teacher, George Matson, uh, and what we do is we study a particular style of Okinawan karate, which is called Weichiru, U-E-C-H-I, Weichiru, named after when I started. Uh, I was very fortunate to hook up with and land in a, in a, in a very good school. So uh, from the first class on, I could not get enough of it. Voraciously, I, I just loved it. And uh, in the early days, I would train five days a week, sometimes six days a week. Uh, and that took precedence over my schooling, education, and everything. Even though I, I did graduate from, uh, from BC with a BS in uh, business administration, and uh, but I kept my karate up during that whole time. So I just thought that s self defense would be something cool to know, something good to learn, and it might stand by me going into the military. And uh, so that's what started it. And I had no grandiose plans of being a martial arts professional, a martial arts teacher. Or, I just thought it'd be something cool to learn. But once I started, I couldn't stop. One of the things that often comes up when we talk about people joining the martial arts, when they jump in, as you did with both feet and just kind of immerse themselves, it usually signifies something that was lacking in their life, whether they realized it or not. We've had enough guests come on that were aware of what they were looking for when they joined martial arts. Was there something in your life that you were throwing yourself at martial arts to to seek out or to avoid something externally? What? Honestly, I think not. I think... Uh... My prime motivating reason was, uh, again, going into the, the military. I would be going in as an infantry officer. I just thought self, I'd be well served if I could learn something about self-defense or taking care of myself. I had a very happy up upbringing and a very lovely family life. So I don't think I was running away from anything or I don't think I was trying to find something in particular other than, gee, it would be good to know how to take care of yourself. And you wanted uh, to come I home. Yes. So uh, that was that was it. I, I just loved it from the start. And uh, actually, when I uh, graduated from Boston College, I got a two year deferment from the military to uh, uh, get my MBA. And uh, again, that gave me two more years to practice my martial arts before I went on active duty service. And uh, during that time, I did 1969. Actually, I received my my showdown, my first degree black belt. And then uh, after doing that, spent two years in the Army, one year at Fort Carson, Colorado, and one year uh, in Vietnam. Did your martial arts serve you while you were in Vietnam? It did. And people ask me that all the time. Did you use your karate in Vietnam? And I was an infantry lieutenant, and I was an advisor to a South Vietnamese infantry battalion. And uh, people ask me, do, do I use my martial arts? Well, I was fortunate enough never to be in any hand-to-hand -hand combat where I had to fight with my hands. But I think my martial arts training served me very well in terms of confidence, belief in myself, patience, and just the ability to believe in myself. You know, before I left for Vietnam, my teacher, George Matson, put his arm around me. I'll never forget it. And he said, don't worry, Buzz. He said, all our black belts have done well over there. And I thought of that many times under stressful situations. So I, I would like to think that I use my martial arts training, my karate practice every day as a doing a kata by myself as a centering exercise or just having the belief that I could get through whatever I was facing at the time. So I would say I use my karate, yeah, every 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 every, every day. And uh, it's just so much more than just the physical aspect of it. Sure. And of course, most of our listeners are martial artists and that's why I phrased the question the way I did, not did you yeah. have to defend yourself? Did you utilize your martial arts? Did it, well, it... I, I tell a story in my book, and it's the God's honest truth. And 
it might sound a little strange, but uh, uh, we were, I was out in the middle of the jungle in a small compound built by Special Forces A-Team. And one night we got a, uh, a notice that uh, 2,000 North Vietnamese regulars were going to attack our, our compound. I was with the team. I was an advisor. I had five other Americans with me, and that was it. And we had about 80 South Vietnamese. So we did everything we could to prepare for that eventuality uh, in terms of putting out more wire, putting up more Claymore mines, no one slept that night, etc. And when everything was prepared, it was very overwhelming. I went down to a bunker all by myself and I did a kata. And having doing that kata gave me such internal strength that I was thought I was prepared for anything. I could handle anything and I had control over something which I couldn't control of. And uh, so I used my karate that time and as as the luck of God would have it, the fate of the the gods uh that night, the North Vietnamese went totally around us, didn't even have a, a skirmish. So uh, I used my karate on that type of, in that type of experience, I should say. If that makes any sense. It does. Uh, I've never served, statistically, the majority of our listeners have never served. And even fewer of them have seen a situation like that, combat. Is there any experience in martial arts training that mimics the, I, I would guess, adrenaline or just kind of that emotional gut response that I'm I'm assuming was part of being over there? Is there a way you can relate it to martial arts for the rest of us? Well, honestly, I must say nothing compares with the experience of combat or being shot at. Uh, but the the martial arts training for me, the karate training for me, just gave me the confidence to know that I was doing my best. I could do my best, and uh, whatever happened happened. But I, I, it gave me a lot of confidence, and I wasn't afraid. Uh, I knew what I had to do, and I did my best to do it. Uh, I don't think uh, so. Martial arts prepared me for those types of situations through uh, rigorous training through repetition, through challenging myself. And uh, that all stood by me under the darkest of moments for me. You, of course, shared a story there, one you mentioned that was in your book. We're going to talk about what you've written as we get deeper into the show. But here on Martial Arts Radio, we drive everything through stories. It seems to be a hallmark of the martial arts. So it works well. If I was to ask you for your favorite martial arts story, what would that be? Well, it would be a self-deprecating story. <laughs> and uh, if I tell you the story, you, you people won't believe me, but it, it, it'll really show you how how uh, it's it's a true story. In 1967, I was a green belt at the Matson Academy of Karate in Boston. And at that time, the headmaster, his first visit to uh, Boston, to America from Okinawa, Mr. Kanye Weiji Sensei came. And I was only a lowly green belt. And when Mr. Weiji came, he had an entourage of people with him. He had a beautiful, beautiful, impeccably gi, uh, embroidered beautifully, a beautiful back belt with embroidery on the belt and stripes on the belt. He had jet black hair, he had no glasses, he had contacts, and he had an entourage. Now, I saw Mr. Weiji had very little interaction with him because I was such a novice at the time, uh, but I remembered him. So flash, flash forward four and a half years, uh, and I'm in Vietnam and I need to take an R&R, &R, rest and recreation. And the spots were Thailand, uh, Australia, the Philippines, but I wanted to go to Okinawa because I just wanted to go to Okinawa and train with Mr. Weiji. And my, when I put in my request, it was denied because it wasn't a regular R&R &R spot. I put it in again. It was denied a second time. I put it in for Okinawa the third time, listing the, that I was a black belt, that uh, the black belt made me perform better in the field or whatever. And it finally was, was approved. So when I got to Okinawa, I was very excited. I was all by myself. This was 1971, and uh, I went to the headquarters dojo, and lo and behold, there was no one there less for one person. It was uh, 
and it was a little old man in a tattered gi, tattered, frayed, old black belt, big black horn rim glasses, and white hair. And I thought, well, this must be a, a, a senior student of Mr. Wagey's uh, holding on the fort while the master is away uh, at some country or whatever. Now, no one spoke English. There were no Americans in the dojo at the time. So and I was there for two weeks. So I uh, went over, smiled, shook hands with this man, and he knew why I was there. He gave me a uniform, put on a gi, and I worked with him for a, all afternoon. The next day I came back, it was the same thing. So I had for like five or six days in a row where I'm working one-on-one, -on -one, just the two of us, with uh, this old Okinawan man. And once in a while, little Okinawan children would come in, and, and that was the extent of it. And uh, I must say, I was getting a little depressed, and I was a little discouraged because I'd made all these special arrangements, all these plans. I was in this part of the world. God knows what was going to happen to me when I went back to Vietnam, and I haven't met Mr. Weiji yet. So I was getting a little resentful, and I was I was not enjoying to its fullest my chance with this with this old man. And uh, although he treated me like a son, he was great. We had mikan juice, kind of an orange juice drink every day. He spoke no English, but he was a magnificent teacher. So I had this uh, one night, someone said to me, come down tonight to the dojo. And I went to the dojo that night and the place was packed. And it was packed. And it was like, uh, this was like almost two weeks up. And they were doing some kind of testing. And uh, I ran into an American for the first time. I'll never forget him, an American Marine. And uh, we introduced ourselves. Hi, how you doing? I'm here on leave from Nam, et cetera, et cetera. And he was getting ready to go over there. And uh, I said, I'm, I, and I confided in him. I said, as we we're stretching out before class, I said, I'm a little disappointed. I said, I've been here almost two weeks and I haven't met Mr. Wagey. And the Marine looked at me and said, who you been training with, man? I'll never forget it. He said, who you been training with, man? And I pointed to, uh, to the old elderly man in the front of the dojo and he goes, that's him. That's Mr. Wagey. You didn't know? So I had been training two weeks one-on-one -on -one every day with the master and I didn't even know it. Now that might sound weird and I could blame my not knowing on a million things. The way he was treated in America, the way I remember him with a beautiful new belt, beautiful new gi, dyed black hair, contact lenses rather than the big horn rimmed glasses. And it just struck me that I wasn't living in the precious present. You know, I could have enjoyed it more if I knew what I was doing. So the lesson for me was mushin, no anticipation, enjoy what you're doing at the moment and thrive with every with, with every minute. Now, that might sound like a, a really weird story, but I could blame it on combat stress. I could blame it on uh, just tension or no relaxation, no, no one to communicate with. But that's the absolute... Uh, Truth. So here I was working with the, this person for two weeks, almost exclusively, and not even realizing it. What a dummy, huh? Well, I, th I think so. So we, I, anybody could make that mistake. <laughs> such such yeah, a well, contrast. There's a million reasons why, but it, but it taught me. It taught me a lot. It taught me don't have preconceived thought. Just enjoy what you're doing at the moment. And I try and always uh, live like that. Actually. Now I'm curious. So that was. So that's it's you, people hear that story and they say that's not that couldn't be true. You couldn't be that dumb. And I'd say, yes, I was. <laughs> what happened next? What happened after you realized your mistake? Well, I just not, nothing really happened. Uh, we, we still enjoyed a wonderful relationship. My relationship with him externally didn't didn't uh, change at all. And he he didn't know whether I knew who he was or not, I don't think. But. We, we actually, we developed, I think, a unique and special bond. We had a, uh, and years later, 20 years later, when he came to America, mine was one of two dojos that he wanted to visit, which I was very proud of. Wow. So, uh, no, it just, it just really struck me that, uh, that idea of mushin, you know, the no mindedness, no, no anticipation, no preconceived thought. I had all kinds of preconceived thoughts about how the master would look, how he would be treated in his home dojo the entourage around him, et cetera. And none of that was, was true. So it was a good learning uh, experience for me, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> now I sound so silly, you probably don't even want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> I absolutely want to talk to you. And, and the reason why is we all make those silly mistakes. I, I think we've all made 
well, hopefully just one or two. I know I've made dozens of mistakes that are at least as goofy, and I'm not going to share them because this is your time, but trust me, listeners, yeah. I've, I, I think we've all done it. We've all been foolish, but isn't that part of learning? You know, yeah, it we, is part of learning. And the thing that struck me the most was, uh, you know, uh, I think a real master shows it, in, uh, a man who has achieved mastery shows it in his every action. And uh, Mr. Wagey, to me, was the ultimate uh, master. He was kind, he was compassionate, he was understanding, he was patient. All those wonderful martial virtues that we talk about, he really personified. And I just learned so much, even thinking about it in retrospect, uh, what I learned from him in terms of accepting people and, uh, and being a real person. Obviously, excuse me. Obviously, your life has shown a lot of dedication to the martial arts, and it doesn't look like that's stopping anytime soon. But outside, no, I, I mean I love what I do. It's it's who I am, really. I've been practicing now fifty one years, and wow. I've had my school for forty four years, and it's been a sheer joy. And people that outside the martial arts world will say, "Oh, is you ever going to retire?" And retire from what? I mean, I love what I do every day. I love the students. Uh, I love being at the dojo, and it's really who I am. And I'm fortunate now to have uh, wonderful people around me, all of whom who work at the dojo, grew up at the dojo. So it's, we have a a wonderful culture and it's a, uh, it's just a great experience. So it's been nothing but a sheer joy. And I can honestly say when every Monday comes around, I'm just anxious to, to get, to get back at it again. So I've been very, very blessed. And someone will say to me, Ask me about work, and I'll say I haven't gone to work a day in forty-four years, and I sincerely feel that way. It's just a, it's just been a true blessing. Can you imagine a version of your life without martial arts? Honestly, no, no. It's it's who I am. It's who I've become. It's I I I relate it honestly to to every everything I do. Everything I do. There's no separation between. I would like to think how I am at the dojo and how I am out in traffic or how I am at the grocery store. Uh, I just can't imagine uh, what I would be like and uh, w- w- without it, honestly. It's been a great ride and it's, it's very much fun and I meet wonderful people, talk to wonderful people like yourself and some of the other people that we've mentioned and uh, I've been very, uh, very fortunate. On those weekends when you're not teaching or, you know, I'm sure you're not training on your own 24 hours a day, are there things that you enjoy doing outside of martial arts? Well, I'm a real homebody, <laughs> a really boring person, but I do, I do enjoy playing tennis. I play tennis regularly and I just find that as a, a, a nice change. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I play tennis a lot and I play tennis uh, competitively and it's, it's, it's fun. So that would be my one diversion, I would say, from the dojo and from martial martial arts. But of course, I can apply a lot of the concepts that I've learned and developed through in my training uh, on the tennis court, believe it or not, in terms of not anticipating, in terms of uh, focus and concentration and controlling your mind, and plus the physicality. Mm, of course. I'd like you to tell us about a time in your life where martial arts sort of saved you something wasn't going right and you were able to use either your physical skills or other elements of your martial training to get through that difficult time well let me see i'd be uh well i think i we were one of the first people in the uh, uh i was one of the first persons in the in the country really to build their own school We built this 8,000 square foot structure from the ground on up. This was back in 1987, 88. And when I did, very few people, a handful of people had done it across the country and certainly no one had done it in New England. And when I came up with the, uh, I rented a small 1,800 square foot facility for 14 years with the objective being to simp, scrimp, save, and uh, someday build our own school. Well, when I started talking to people about building my own school, I was laughed at many, many times. No one had done it. Most martial arts schools at the time were a storefront where you could roll up the rug, take down the heavy bag, and be gone the next night. And uh, uh, what I wanted to do was almost a million-dollar project uh, 
devoted entirely to traditional martial arts. And uh, it was, we had a lot of roadblocks, a lot of roadblocks. And uh, I kept persevering, persevering. And I think the thing that allowed me to keep persevering was the training. I knew that I'd accomplish it. And when I felt like it wasn't going well or I was taking too long, I just revert back to my training and, and just delve into the, uh, the, the training. And, and that just gave me such perseverance uh, that I, I was determined to, to make it happen. And I've had, I had realtors laugh at me. I've had realtors tell me, they come on up, I got this thing for you to look at. And it was with a dance studio. No, I wanted to build it from the ground on up, a freestanding building. So I had a plan. I, I, tech, I mentioned this in my book, too. And it was a plan of positive expectancy. And I never would have had the courage or the confidence to do this without my martial training. So I obviously had a, a bank that I went to. And one day I went into the bank and uh, I said, who's the vice president, who's the manager or whatever. And they showed me who it was. I went over to his office and I said, hey, I'm Buzz Durkin. I'm going to come to you someday about building my own building. And now this person who uh, didn't know me from a hole in the wall, didn't know who I was, didn't even know what I did. So I made it a point of every time I went to the bank to make a deposit, to get checks or whatever, I would stop in, knock on his office and say, remember, I'm Buzz Durkin. I'm going to come and see you about the uh, building a building. God's honest truth. And I did this for three and a half years, almost four years. Every time I went into the bank, I saw that person. Now, by this time, he knew who I was. And I said, I'm going to come see you about my building. And then uh, one day, true story, I went into the bank and I was preoccupied. I had 100 things on my mind, made a deposit, and I went straight out the door without going into this person's office. Well, lo and behold, the door opens behind me and this vice president comes running out. He looks at me, he says, Buzz, what about your building? And the minute he said that, I knew we had, a, I knew I, I knew we had him. And I said, well, let's talk. And that, that was four years of, of doing that. And he, that was the, the bank that, that gave us the loan to uh, get the funds for what we needed. You know, and at the time, when I built this building, I had to increase enrollment by 25% just to make the bills. But I, and I was encouraged to do it. I, was, I knew what we had to do it. I put my house up as a, a, a second mortgage uh, that if the dojo didn't succeed, I would have lost my house. But my wife was with me on board 100%, and, and I just knew we'd make it happen. And uh, I think that, that confidence, that perseverance, that ability to believe in myself all came through my training, my physical training. It, it, it really did. So uh, we eventually... Built the building, and uh, we've been here almost 30 years now, and happy, happy ever after. <laughs> <laughs> of course, some folks are listening, they're doing the math, they're thinking, 8,000 square feet, this guy must live right in the middle of Boston, or, or Chicago, or some other really large city that, that can support that number of students. You, you, and I'm sure everyone else can tell I'm being sarcastic here. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting, we have people still... I'm happy to say, come from all over the world to visit us and stay with us monthly and see what we do. Our school is really known for retention, and we don't enroll a heck of a lot of people every month. I'm in a small town of 3,000-plus people, 6,000 people. No, my, take it back, 6,000 people now. So we're in a town of 6,000 people, and we keep an enrollment of 300 students. And we've been fortunate to be able to do that and uh, – over time, we have many second and third generation family members here, and uh, it's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. So we're, we're in a small town, 6,000 people. Of course, there's peripheral towns around us, but primarily Atkinson, New Hampshire, population 6,000 plus, and uh, that's where our school is located, and that community has been able to support our school in a fine fashion. Hmm. And I think the reason is... Uh, what makes our school go is not marketing, not uh, next latest fad on getting people in, but just retention. And my philosophy always has been we teach people first, martial arts second. And everybody that comes in to see me has a heart, a soul, feelings and emotions. And if you take that into consideration first, I think you're well on your way to, to uh, meeting someone where they, where they want to be. You know, uh, one of my uh, mentors is a man by the name of Harvey McKay, who's a very famous author. 
He wrote the best sell- number of best-selling books. Uh, Swim with the Sharks, though, Being Eaten Alive, is, was probably his most famous. And his philosophy was always think long-term and think in human terms. And that's how I've tried to run the school, and that's how I try and make every decision. So if someone comes in with a challenge, I don't look at them as a karate student, a green belt, a brown belt. They're a human being. They have feelings. They have emotions. They have a heart and soul. They want to be treated with human dignity. Uh, think long term and think in human terms. And with, with long term, if uh, I never do anything for the quick appeasement, you know, how, how's this uh, decision I make now going to affect me uh, five months from now, five years from now, ten years from now? And that's the way we think. And that's been a good philosophy for us because it's it's worked for us. I haven't had to uh, to change that. So we always try and think long term. What's in the best interest of the school? And uh, think in human terms, because people first, martial arts second. Hmm. That's kind of been the philosophy upon which we've built the school. It sounds like a great philosophy. It sounds like it's certainly working. Do you think that's a mistake most martial arts school owners are making? That they're not doing that? Uh, I think it's education. I think you, sometimes you can get caught up on... The physical, the technique, the amba, the choco, the takedown, the front kick, the punch. Uh, and that's all, I look upon all that stuff as the vehicle to develop great human qualities uh, like patience, like confidence, like perseverance, like belief in self. So we use our uh, Okinawan curriculum, our eight kata, etc., cetera, to, uh, as the vehicle for the student to develop confidence, to develop belief in oneself, etc. And I don't think enough teachers today relate the two. Uh, if someone's a better fighter than someone in your, if someone's the best fighter in your dojo, for instance, where's that? what's that going to get them in life, really? Uh, but yet, everyone needs to have patience. Everyone needs to have confidence, belief in themselves. Everyone needs to persevere to be successful. And if the teacher can show how the physical curriculum that they're teaching develops these traits and how they're, the, the real value is not so much on the dojo floor, but the real value is how they're used and applied out in the real world. People will always come back. The real world, as we know, can be a very negative place with so much negativity. A good martial arts school is full of positive vibrations, positive people, positive community. And I think a lot of our students who've been coming for literally decades come back to just get the batteries recharged. There's so much to drain you on the outside. You come in, you have a workout with like-minded people, supportive people, people who are trying to make you get better as they get better. Then you're better able after class to face those challenges and and those life issues. And those life issues stay with you whether you're 14, 40, or 64. Uh, So people will, will keep coming back if a teacher can relate the real important things in life, the thing that, that, that the vehicle of the martial arts, the physicality of the martial arts uh, allows us to develop. We've heard about a couple of the folks who have been really influential on your martial arts, Mr. Matson, Mr. Weichi, of course. If I was to ask you for a third name, someone who just clearly guided you or, or, or elevated your skills or anything, however you want to define it, they were instrumental. Who would that be? Well, that's a good question because you've you've mentioned uh, my teacher and you've mentioned the, the, the headmaster of our style. Uh, you know, I think my father instilled a lot of this stuff in me, actually. And uh, I guess one role model that I admire among all the uh, the uh, great martial artists and famous martial artists, although he hasn't had personal effect on my training was uh, Chuck Norris. And I think Chuck Norris does a wonderful job of representing the real value of the uh, of the martial arts. And I think he's a martial artist first, actor second. And uh, I just admire the way he carries himself and his, uh, the way he presents his, uh, the, the martial arts and the way he's exposed the martial arts to so many people. Hmm. Certainly a legendary figure and probably the name that most non-martial artists know more than any other martial artist. Easy to forget Uh, that he has the chops, the real skills. I mean, anybody that has, that was there or like me, wasn't there, but has seen the video of 
his skills back in the 60s and the 70s. Absolutely. I remember watching him fight many times in uh, Madison Square Garden, the Felt Forum, Aaron Banks, World, World of Self-Defense, and he, he was the real, he's the real deal, yeah. Great. Now, if you could train with somebody else that you haven't, anybody in the world, anywhere in time, who would you want to train with? Anywhere in time. If I, uh, I would relish the idea of training with the original founder of this style, Kan Bun Weichi. I think I would love that. I think that would be just so cool. That would be my, my dream instructor. <laughs> and I'm going to press as you, you a little see, bit. I'm very, as you can see, I'm very Weichi oriented, you sure. know? And I, I, think, I think a failing of most, of many, not most, but of many martial arts school owners today is they uh, jump on the martial art du jour. You know, someone down the street is having success teaching this discipline, so I'll teach this discipline. Someone down the street is having uh, success teaching this other form of martial art, I'll teach that other form of martial arts. They have a lot of students, why can't I? And I'm a firm believer that, uh, you know, selling is really just a transference of feeling. And uh, it's not so much what you teach, I think it's your belief and your passion for what you teach that inspires other people and, and gets other people to believe in to believe in, in, in what you're doing. And I think that's a, a very important aspect of, of, of teaching. Your belief, your passion, and truly what you do is almost more important than what you do to communicate with people. And I think there's a lot of uh, instructors that, I, I just call it the martial art du jour. They just jump on what's popular now, having little training in it, having little background in it, and therefore presenting it in a half-baked way and uh, it, it doesn't do anything to enhance this school or, or the people who will benefit from their, from the train, from their teaching. What would you hope to gain from training with him? I mean, you've, you've trained in Wei Chi Ru your entire martial career. You've worked with the best in the world. And most folks are going to put you in that group. So what is it training with the founder of the style you would hope to gain? The origin, the roots, who made up this wonderful curriculum, who developed these fabulous, this fabulous understanding of the human body uh, to make it so effective. Uh, yeah, the, the roots of uh, how it e emerged and, and how, uh, how it was practiced and how it came to be to be such a popular thing. And uh, the roots, really, I think that would be fascinating for me to discover, well, who thought of this and why and what prompted them to think of this and and uh, prove it to be so uh, critically important. Hmm. If that makes any sense. It makes all kinds of sense, yeah. <laughs> I'm the same way. I like to know the why. Dig in, understand the decisions. Because for me, understanding why something was done helps me understand when and how to do it. Well, I think that's a, a very excellent point. And uh, I think you to be successful at martial arts, no equivocation. You have to do it. You have to do it. You just have to do it. Repeat, repetition, repetition. You have to do it. Uh, but you also have to study it. And if you do it and study it, you'll just develop a, such a better understanding. Your, your ability will be enhanced at a more rapid rate as well. So I think a, a lot of people just do it blindly. But if you do it and study it, and what does this move mean? Or where did this come from? Or how could I really apply it in this situation? And I know in my dojo, the people and the senior students who do that, not only practice regularly, but truly study it, uh, uh, just turn out to be the, the finest martial artists. We may have someone listening who's thinking, okay, I, I understand you intellectually, but how would I study martial arts? What would you tell them? Well, you have to, ex you have to start with an attitude of acceptance. And there's just so much that uh, to be learned. And it's good to question, but you have to start with an attitude of acceptance. And this martial arts, regardless of style, is hundreds of years old. It's proven, past the test of time, even in terms of just pure self-defense, physicality. So if someone's starting out, how do they do it? They do it by uh, enjoying the ecstasy of sweat and just do it and have an attitude of acceptance. Put trust in your teacher and the teacher will trust the student. And there's no answer other than time and to really uh, 
feel the benefits, to understand the benefits, you have to experience the benefits. No one can really talk to you about it. You have to experience it yourself. So repetition, experience the ecstasy of sweat, as we like to say here at the school, and uh, and have an attitude of acceptance because this this stuff has been around for hundreds of years and it's worked effectively. And and uh, sure, times change, but the the human anatomy hasn't changed that much. And uh, it's so you have to. I think I would say have an attitude of acceptance, be ready to work hard, enjoy the spirit of repetition. Uh, you know, there's two ways to look at repetition. You can look at it and say, oh, this is again, I'm so bored of doing this. Or you can say, I'm going to study this and find the deeper meaning. Why does he want me to do this over and over? Aha, maybe there's an epiphany moment there. And really, you can't beat the ecstasy of sweat. You just have to do it. And in a good dojo, it encourages that type of training because if I'm a student in that class, by working hard, I get better. If I get better, every one of my partners has to get better. So it's a mutually uh, beneficial thing. As the group gets better, the individual gets better. As the individual gets better, the group gets better. And it's just a a wonderful learning experience. And uh, again, you develop traits that will stand by you in life, and that's a a beautiful thing. And I think there's martial arts is unique in that it can develop mind, body, spirit, and afford so many benefits, so many benefits, uh, for anyone's daily life. I mean, we had a class this morning and we had several men in their 70s and an 80-year-old woman and she's just going along like like it's beautiful. And I don't expect them to train like a 23-year-old, but it's a, it's a, martial arts when taught correctly, I think is a lifelong exercise habit that you can benefit from when you're four years old or 84 years old. See, I'm getting on my soapbox now because I just love it so much, and I, I just so firmly believe in, in what I'm saying. Well, you are preaching to the choir here, <laughs> and of course the majority of the folks listening are going to agree with you. But at the same time, you're giving them beautifully succinct ways to express it that I'm sure they're going to take back into their martial arts schools and the places they train themselves. And they're going to share those poignant words that maybe someday will become the next cliches because they're that effective. Well, I I hope so. And, you know, I think a lot of school owners, especially new school owners, think it's much more difficult to get students in the door than it is to keep them. And I don't agree with that. I think it's much more difficult to keep them than to get people in. And if the focus is on retention, if the focus is on really nurturing and taking care of the people who have committed to training with you, the school will blossom. You reminded me as you were speaking of one of my favorite sayings, and I don't remember what the context is for this or or who said it or anything. I don't believe it's a martial arts statement. If you look around the room and you're the best person, it's time to get a new room. Yeah, 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 that's, 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 that's very true. And it's like you hang around with smart people, you get smart. That's right. (laughs) And uh, associate with successful people and you'll learn what makes them successful. Absolutely. You mentioned Chuck Norris and having seen him at Madison Square Garden. Were you ever a competitor yourself? You know, my my journey was, was uh, yes, I, I competed all throughout New England as a Q-ranking student. When I got my black belt, I was really off in the military. Uh, my first year in Colorado, I competed in tournaments out there. Never had any huge, great success, although I got a few trophies here and there. But uh, I was never a sport karate stand out, let's put it that way. And I think uh, it appealed to me, but just the logistics of the timing of where I was stationed, where how, how, my, uh, how it all played out for me didn't really develop into a, the focus of that. And when I got out of the service and I started teaching at my original dojo, Matson Academy of Karate, I had a I would I had a very large following. I had some of the bigger biggest classes of the week, and I enjoyed doing it, and I had a great following, and that's what made me think that well, if I can do it here, maybe I can do it on my own, and that's what made me one of the reasons which I started my school. Martial arts movies. It's a subject that sometimes we get really deep into the weeds on this show. As I think you can imagine, martial arts movies not only are, are something that a lot of martial artists are passionate about; they've often led to waves of new martial arts student, Karate Kid or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. 
What's your relationship with martial arts movies? Do you enjoy them? Not so much. I enjoy them. I take them for what they are, mostly fantasy. But I think the the the, the finest, the best, the uh, the most memorable was the Karate Kid, the original one with Ralph Macchio, and that I would have to say that's probably my favorite because what that did at the time was opened up the dojos to children for the first time and young people flooded the dojos after after that movie. And uh, like when I started and uh, at the Matson Academy in 1966, 67, th- that school was a melting pot. And George Matson had over 500 students and there might have been a dozen children. Imagine that. The, the Karate Kid movie really opened the floodgates for the for the kids. And then as a result of the kids coming into the dojo, the parents, the dads would watch and then they became involved in martial arts. So that's really the catalyst, I think, for making it a a family environment. And even today throughout the country, there's so many families that study. And I think that was a reflection of the Karate Kid movie, really. Were there any other movies that you recall that have ushered in waves as as you saw it in your dojo? That ushered in what? I'm sorry. New students, you know, something else culturally that happened that made people show up. I mean, I guess oh, even outside yeah, of I movies. Think the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was good for children. <laughs> And then you could move on to the Power Rangers. So they all had an effect, none of which I think had as big an effect as the Karate Kid movie. But I think the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle thing did. And uh, Chuck Norris had a couple of good movies like Sidekicks. Mm. And uh, uh, so it, it all it all all adds up. It all added up to bringing students in, into the into the dojo and to making martial arts training more acceptable. I mean, we even see it on TV commercials now. You know, it's great. And uh, it should be like that. Couldn't agree more. We're going to talk about what you've written, you know, the books that you're known for. But before we go there, are there other books from other people that you're fond of that you might recommend folks read? I think a great martial art book is Kudo, The Martial Ways, K-U-D-O, The Martial Ways. And it was written by a Japanese man. I can't pronounce, I can't think of his name. It escapes me at the moment. But that's a tremendous, easy, simple read, philosophically very sound. And it's it's a nice, nice book. As is the classic Zen in the Martial Arts by Joe Hyams, another another, classic. But those two books, Kudo, Martial Ways, and uh, Zen in the Martial Arts, I think are two excellent books for a martial arts school owner to read. We and I, you know, from a business point of view, I think my all-time favorite book from a, a two books actually my, for, for someone who's running a school is get that classic "Swim with the Sharks Without Being Eaten Alive." And there's just so much common sense, business savvy in that book. And the the other book that uh, was written by Hank Trisla called "No Bull Selling," and that's just a wonderful, easy to read book. I love books that are easy to read. And those two books are wonderful business books for any martial arts school owner to uh, to to read and and apply. Actually, hmm. all right. Now it's time to talk about what you've written. So I, I, I'll confess, I don't know how many books you have written. I've written one. It's only the it's only the one. Only the one. Okay. People talk about it so often. Then it's it's been mentioned on the show a number of times. I didn't log it in my brain as the title, but more so the author. So your name has been brought up on the show quite a few times. And I guess, tell us about your book and my apologies for getting that wrong. No, no, that's, that's fine. <laughs> it's, uh, Buzz Durkin, the martial arts school owner's guide to teaching business and life. The title of the book is success is waiting. Success is waiting. And you know, I, the book was written, we wrote it two years ago and, uh, I had so many anecdotal stories, and uh, I've enjoyed a very wonderful time teaching martial arts, and I wanted to share that. But I, I've, 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 I had accumulated so many anecdotal stories about dealing with people, dealing with situations, dealing with martial training, that I, I just thought it would be good to, one of the things I wanted to do was share it and maybe help out a new aspiring dojo owner or a young school owner. So uh, that's what I did, and uh, it was a joy. Uh, you spoke with Bill earlier. He was immense in helping me uh, get on track and doing it. And uh, it's been very well received, got great Amazon reviews, and uh, it's done very well, actually. So I've been very 
blessed by that. It's really my story. And uh, other than the introduction, uh, there's a section on student service, how to better serve your students. There's a section on what to do, what not to do. Uh, there's a section on training. So it's uh, really been uh, filled with just anecdotal stories that you couldn't make up. Oftentimes the truth is stranger than fiction, you know, but we have a, a stood part on the the essentials uh, of what it takes to, to be successful as with a, as a martial arts school owner and in life, commitment, perseverance, confidence, passion. I have a section on things to learn and remember as a teacher, uh, a whole section on teaching tips, student service tips, and what I call best business practices for long-term success. So uh, what I did when I had this idea, I'll share with you, I got a big whiteboard in one of the extra bedrooms at the house, at my house, a huge whiteboard, and I just it would take little post-its, and I'd say, this would be a good topic, put it on top of the whiteboard, and and for about a year, when I came home at night, I said, gee, I talked about this in class today, what category would that fall under? So it was like a storyboard of the book, and then I knew all the stories, because I had lived them, and I, then I just started writing, and uh, it's primarily anecdotal, uh, re relating uh, stories about uh, students and and how that can help a, a school owner today so it was it was a fun experience and uh i i, I enjoyed doing it and hopefully uh people have treated their students better because of it <laughs> well i know it has made an impact i can't say how much you certainly know more than i do based on the numbers that have sold and that's not me asking in fact i i don't want to know that's private but I know that the folks that have come on the show and spoken of the book have spoken of it very fondly. I'll confess, I haven't read it. I have a huge stack of martial arts books I'm trying to get to, and yours is in there. <laughs> is it, if, if mine isn't in there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you a copy right now. <laughs> it, is, it is definitely in there. It is definitely in there. Uh, well, I wanted a book. One yeah. of my, I had two goals. It had to be a book that was easy to read, because I like books that are easy to read, and I know martial artists are very caught up in time. So it had to be a book that was easy to read and, and had to have short chapters. I wanted a book that you could pick it up, read, read a two- or three-page chapter, put it down, and read another chapter a week later and put it down. So I think I accomplished those two things. It's uh, an easy read, big font, easy read, and uh, uh, short chapters. That was kind of the formula for Zen and the martial arts. It Which was. is it was. my favorite martial arts book of all time. and That is, yeah. It's a fantastic book. Of course, we we did an entire episode going into the history on, on the book and Joe Hyams and everything, and we'll link that in the show notes. And For anybody that might be new to the show, we do a show notes page at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So if you're driving or on the treadmill or something, you don't have to take notes with all these things we're talking about. We're going to give you notes. Make it easy. Sounds good. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's good. It is clear how much you love martial arts. I mean, it's, I can't imagine anybody ever doubting that. But the question that I find myself asking after 50, how many years did you say? 51 years? 51 years. After 51 years, I'm going to guess you're at least as passionate as you were when you walked into the dojo that first day. And my question is Why? The why of it is for me is that it's such a beautiful habit. It's such a beautiful practice. You can connect with yourself on just so many levels, mentally, attitudinally, physically. I mean, uh, I can I keep going back to it being a lifelong exercise habit, and there is no denying it. Martial arts training is good for the soul. It's good for the body. It's good for you. You know, it's interesting. If a student, say, quits our school and I see him a year later at the grocery store. The first thing he says to me, the very first thing that everyone always says to me is, I'm coming back, Mr. Durkin. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And I say, well, just, just say hi for us. Let's, how are you doing? Good to see you. And I, I've often thought of that. Why would someone say that? And the reason they say that is because they know intuitively, instinctively, it's good for them. No one's ever said to me, man, am I glad I stopped martial arts training. That stuff's no good at all. That stuff stinks. That stuff's terrible. No one has ever said that, but everyone always says, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. And I bet this, 
the school owners that are listening to this right now have had that experience. And I often think, well, why, why do they say that? Because who can deny it? It is good for you. It's good for you physically, mentally, emotionally. It's good for your, your entire well-being. Uh, that can't, I, I think it would be very hard for someone to deny that. I mean, the elderly people who do it, people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, just the, the fighting against the aging process, just uh, staying flexible, uh, keeping strong bones. I mean, it's, 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 it's great stuff, you know, and, you know, my mantra is 70 is the new 50 and 50 <laughs> is the new 30. And, and it really, truly, you know, taking care of your body, regular exercise, eating healthy. Uh, my teacher, George Matson now is 80 years old and is so vibrant. It's just an inspiration. And, uh, is a very famous Ouija uh, practitioner, master Nakahodo in Okinawa, who's 86 and he moves like he's 26. It's so no one can deny it, I think. The martial arts training, regardless of style, is just a great practice habit. And uh, that's what keeps me going. I, 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 there's, it, there's no flaw in it. It's, it's perfect, and it's as perfect as you want to make it. Well said. Now, for folks that are listening, if they want to reach you, if they want to find out more about your school and the other things you have going on, maybe social media, things like that, how do they find you? Well, we're at buzzdurkin.com. We have a huge presence on everything, really. Facebook, primarily. Instagram. Twitter. No, no. Twitter. Uh, but Facebook, primarily. And the book is available at thekarateteacher.com or Amazon. Thekarateteacher.com, buzzdurkin.com. Or we're in Atkinson, New Hampshire. Anybody can call me. I love speaking with dojo owners. I just love it. And I love speaking especially with young, new school owners. And if there's anything I can do to have them learn from my foibles and my mistakes. I'm happy to do that. Believe me. That's great. And one more thing before we go, some parting sure. words for the folks listening. Well, I think we've got a martial arts school owners audience, correct? Not entirely school owners, but definitely martial artists. Yeah, definitely martial artists. I think those who dare to teach or lead should never, must never cease to learn. I love that saying. Those who dare to teach or lead must never learn, to cease to learn. And I think that applies for every aspect, certainly for school owners, certainly for martial arts practitioners, and certainly uh, for life. So if we keep learning, you keep experiencing new things, it keeps you vital, it keeps you young, it keeps you current. And uh, especially if you're going to teach, you know, those who dare to teach or lead must never cease to learn. And, uh, I think that's it. And also, I'd go back to what I mentioned earlier. In all your dealings with people, think long term and think in human terms and treat people the way you'd love it if someone treated you like that. Sensei Durkin impressed me with his dedication to sharing the martial arts, not only in his small town, but throughout the world. I enjoyed his stories and I'm hoping to connect with him very soon in person. Sensei Durkin, thank you for your service and thank you for being on the show today. If you want to check out the show notes, remember, those are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got links, we've got titles, we've got social media, we've got everything that you might want to further explore today's episode and learn more about Sensei Durkin. If you want to follow us on social media, we are at Whistlekick pretty much everywhere. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are our primary channels. And of course, you can find all the other things that we do at whistlekick.com. If you want to be a guest on the show or you have someone you'd like to recommend as a guest on the show, fill out the guest form over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. Our best guests come from listener suggestions. Truthfully. I hope wherever you are in the world, you're having a great day. Your training's going well. And this is where I step back. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>